everyone! Welcome to my presentation on what makes a good night's sleep. I am Stephanie Pollock, a student occupational therapist. Before we begin, I wanted to express my gratitude to you for joining me today. I also want you to acknowledge and be grateful to yourselves for taking the time to invest in you and your child's well-being today. With that, let's dive in. Today, I'll briefly cover the following topics. First, we will do a quick progressive muscle relaxation exercise. Then, we'll cover some sleep science and discuss the sleep stages. And then I'm going to go over some common mistakes and some sleep strategies to help with that. I wanted to first disclaim that I am an occupational therapy student and not a sleep specialist. Today's workshop will be general in nature and will not discuss sleep problems such as insomnia. With that, if you or your child are experiencing significant sleep problems that are impacting your ability to function in everyday life and complete the things you need and want to do, I hope this workshop can help you. But if you're having worries beyond this workshop, I would highly recommend you speak to your family doctor. So progressive muscle relaxation. As mentioned in the previous caregiver workshops, progressive muscle relaxation, or PMR, is a great tool to help children and adults de-stress by recognizing and releasing tensions or anxieties. When we are stressed, our muscles tense. The body then receives the message that we're stressed. And as a result, we get stuck in this stress muscle tension cycle. PMR helps to break this cycle by reducing the muscle tension component, which in turn signals to your brain to relax and then helps release those stresses. PMR is not only helpful when you're experiencing stressors, it's a very helpful tool in general as it can support you in directing your mind and body to relax even when you don't realize you're stressed. Helping your body get to that relaxation period is especially helpful prior to sleeping. So, PMR is a great tool to try. When doing PMR, it's helpful to work from the top of the body all the way down to the toes, squeezing and releasing the muscles. For example, you might clench your hands in a fist Hold tight for about five seconds and then release. Later on, you might do the same activity with your toes, squeezing them in, holding and releasing. As you can feel, your body learns to relax as it feels the difference of tension and relaxation. If this is something you're interested in, in script reading, uh, there's lots of online resources and apps one of my favorites is Headspace um, that you and your children can listen to. But today I'm going to share just a snippet of a lovely PMR for kids I found online and I will post the description below if it's something you want to see the full version of. So you can try this in your chair if you'd like, but the idea would be to try it lying down in your bed. And if you're comfortable, please close your eyes and just listen and follow along to my actions. We're going to try the hand and arm exercise, the shoulder and neck, and the face and nose. Pretend you're squeezing a whole lemon in your hand. Squeeze it hard. Try to squeeze all the juice out. Feel the tightness in your hand and arms as you squeeze. Now drop the lemon and relax. See how much better your hand and arm feel when they're relaxed. Now pretend you're a turtle you're sitting out on a rock 
by a nice, peaceful pond, just relaxing in the warm sun. It feels nice and warm and safe here. Uh-oh, you sense danger. Pull your head into your house. Try to pull your shoulders up to your ears and push your head down into your shoulders. Hold tight. It isn't easy to be a, in the, a turtle in the shell, but the danger's now past. You can come out into the warm sunshine and once again, you can relax and feel the warm sunshine. Here comes a pesky old fly. He's landed on your nose. Try to get him off without using your hands. That's right, wrinkle up your nose. Make as many wrinkles in your nose as you can. Scrunch your nose up real hard. Good, you've chased him away. Now you can relax your nose again. So thank you for trying this a little bit of PMR with me. Um, just being mindful of the time, I only wanted to give a small snippet of the script, but again, I will post the full script in the description below if you want to try the exercise. Now that we're relaxed and in a great headspace, I wanted to share this beautiful quote. Your future depends on your dreams, so go to sleep. We all sleep and we all need quality of sleep. Everyone has slight differences and when they sleep, the type of sleep they're used to, what helps them sleep, but we all need it. And although this presentation will be focused for child-friendly tips, the science and recommendations are something you can also do. And I want you to know that working on your sleep hygiene is great to start at a young age, but you can start at any point throughout your lifespan and you will see results. With that, sleep is so important at all ages. Over the average person's lifespan, we spend 26 years sleeping. So it's something we should be pretty good at, right? Well, actually we spend an additional seven years over our lifespan trying to fall asleep. And if you think of young children, as there's such a significant growth and development period uh, during infancy and young childhood, by the age of two, children have spent approximately 40% of their lives sleeping. So quite a lot of time. So why do we sleep? Although we're not consciously aware when we're sleeping, our bodies are very active. Sleep allows our minds and bodies to do important processing, like learning and consolidating memories, restoration from wear and tear of regular day, as well as healing when we're unwell, and to strengthen our body systems so we can grow healthy and strong. We know that kids who regularly get the right amount of sleep have improved attention, behavior, learning, and so much more. So sleep is very important for health and well-being, especially for children as they develop. Moving forward, I think we can all think of how we feel when we've had a bad night's sleep. We have trouble functioning in the days to come. It affects our ability to concentrate, our energy, our mood. So it's very important to develop these good sleep habits, especially from a young age. But again, it's never too old to begin using the strategies either. Before we get into the strategies, it's very important to recognize the stages of the sleep cycle and how the different strategies apply to them. So you may or may not be familiar. For those of you who are, this will just be a brief refresher. And for those of you who are not, this will be a very simple explanation of the sleep cycle. 
and I hope it will help you understand the processes your body go through during sleep a little more. But if it's something you're very interested in, I would encourage you to look up more about the sleep cycle as it's a very interesting and helpful topic to know. So the sleep cycle has five stages and it can also be broken down into REM, which stands for rapid eye movement and non-REM sleep. Non-REM sleep is stages one through four. During stage one, you're just nodding off. Your brain begins to send different signals to let the body know you're falling asleep. As this period is relatively light sleep, you're somewhat aware and can be easily awoken, almost like a cat nap. Stage two is also this light sleep stage. Your brain begins to send signals to sleep. And if you woke up at this stage, it almost would be like you had a power nap. During stages three and four, you enter a deep sleep or a restorative phase. This is when the body repairs the muscles and tissues, helps with growth and development, um, immune function, and builds the energy for the next day. And in this deep sleep stage, you're not going to have any muscle movements. And it will be much more difficult to be awoken as your body is no longer responding to environmental stimuli. Finally, we have rapid eye movement or REM sleep. During this phase of sleep, your brain becomes more active and your eyes quickly move in different directions, hence the name REM. Other functions like your breathing, heart rate, and blood pressure increase during this phase. This phase is very important for learning and memory, and it's also the phase where our dreams occur. We often think we're dreaming all night, but it's really only during REM, which is conveniently the phase before we wake up. Now, it's important to recognize in adults, throughout a whole night's sleep, we might go through stages one through five or one through REM six times. And each time we pass through REM, we have these micro awakenings, which we may or may not wake up for. Um, and even if you do wake up for it, chances are you won't remember. So this is a sleep cycle uh, diagram. And as you can see in this graph, as the night progresses, we spend less time in that deep, steep, steep sleep stage, which is stage three and four, and a little bit more time in REM and the light sleep stages. Um, in fact, we spend about 60% of our time in light sleep, 20 to 25 in REM, and 20% in that deep sleep stage. Early in the night, we spend most of our time in that light sleep. And then later in the night, we spend more time in the REM sleep. So this is again why we often wake up dreaming. Here, I just found these two graphs that compare adult versus the infant sleep cycle. It's very important to note that the infant's duration of each stage is slightly different. While an adult sleep cycle can range between 90 and 120 minutes, infants could be 45 or 60 minutes between the two. That's again going through stages 1 through 4 and REM. And unlike adults who spend that 20 to 25 percent of their sleep in REM, as infants are undergoing so many cognitive changes and brain development, they spend a much longer time in REM sleep. It's approximately 50% of their sleep. Now recall that REM comes prior to waking up. This is another reason why infants wake up more during the night. And the same is true for younger children, as they spend a greater amount of time in REM compared to adults. Infants also have a lighter sleep pattern from an evolutionary perspective. They wake up easily so they can get out of threatening situations like being uncomfortable or being wet or being hungry. Fortunately, babies eventually learn to self-soothe and will get back to sleep without needing mom or dad. And as a child grows, the sleep cycle will start to look more and more like an adult. That means less and less time is spent in REM, 
and simultaneously the sleep cycle itself lengthens. So eventually by the school age your child should be sleeping in cycles of about 90 minutes. So now that we know what's happening when we sleep, it's important to know what helps us to sleep. The two systems that help our body know when to sleep is our sleep-wake homeostasis and our body clock or circadian rhythms. The sleep-wake homeostasis, also sometimes called a sleep drive, balances time to sleep and time to be awake. We start the day after a sleep full of energy and throughout the day our energy depletes and we sleep again and this cycles on. But, as you know, you don't always start the day with the most amount of energy. You have periods of greater wakefulness and sleepiness. This is our circadian rhythms. The circadian rhythms are controlled by a part of the brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, or SCN, which responds to light and dark signals. The SCN sends messages to other parts of the brain which influences sleepiness, such as change in body temperature or the releasing of hormones. For example, in the morning, exposure to, the S exposure to light, the SCN signals the brain to increase body temperature and delay the release of melatonin. Conversely, when the SCN processes darkness, melatonin levels rise, promoting sleep. A good thing to remember is to limit light at night, especially blue light, and use red or that natural sunlight in the morning to support waking up, as this will help your SCN send the correct signals. So how much sleep do we need? This chart is based off of Caring for Kids, which is a pediatric website and the study was based off of the American Academy of Sleep Recommendations. So as we grow and develop, we need different amounts of sleep. Newborns can sleep as much as 18 hours a day, and these can be in bouts of three to four hours. As they enter four to 12 months of age, they sleep an average of 14 hours per day, and this includes naps in the day and around 6 to 12 months, they may start taking less naps during the day. Toddlers sleep between 11 and 14 hours in a 24 hour period. Regular naps are still important, but naps later in the afternoon maybe should be avoided as they could interrupt nighttime sleep. Young children from age three to five typically sleep 10 to 13 hours per day. Scheduled nap times are still very common around this age. If you find your child is resisting a nap, you could still have a scheduled nap time that just has some relaxation and downtime um, instead of any vigorous activity so they can choose to nap or just relax. It's important to know at this age, there are some sleep problems such as resisting sleep, to um, just because of that kind of control, they want to stay up later or trouble with nightmares. So I will touch on some strategies to do to try it later on. And finally, older children sleep should sleep around nine to twelve hours, teens eight to ten, and then adults seven to nine. Hopefully, this list uh, doesn't surprise you. Um, as you can see, newborns, babies, toddlers. They need a lot of sleep, even children at that school age, a lot of sleep. And this is because we're often not getting enough sleep. Um, so naps are encouraged as long as they're scheduled and routine, which we'll kind of get into later on. And for your own health as well, trying to get that approximately eight hours of sleep is very, very important for health. So when going over healthy habits, remember to try to apply them to yourself as well. So now I'm gonna go over some common mistakes. 
Many of us have trouble sleeping and falling asleep. And the same applies to infants and young children. So I compiled a list of some of the most common mistakes parents make, and then I'll touch on some solutions to fix them. The first is misreading sleepiness cues. Signs of tiredness include rubbing eyes, yawning, fussing, and in terms of decreased attention, you know, they may not longer be playing or focused on you. Conversely, signs of overtiredness are that intense eye rubbing, big yawns, crankiness, agitation, and maybe even more wired. So, an overtired child will have more trouble sleeping. You should try to put your child to bed when they're still awake, but when they start to demonstrate these signs of tiredness. It's really helpful if you can learn to recognize your child's differences in tired and overtired. As soon as they begin to get tired, they again release that melatonin. But if they miss that period, our brains then begin to send cortisol, which will overstimulate them and make sleeping much more challenging. A kind of helpful tip that my professor taught me is overtired equals wired. So they're overtired, they may not look like they're tired because they have all this energy, but they are. The next is a poor sleep environment. Think about yourself. How, what helps you sleep? You might be able to sleep anywhere, but likely you have your best sleep in your bed. Personally, I need a very dark room with no noise. Children are the same. If the environment is too stimulating, it's not conducive to their sleep. And stimuli can include noise, light, visual cues like toys, etc. If we have too many activities going on, we don't focus on sleep. We need to condition our brains that bed equals sleep. By sleeping in the same bed each night, we pair that and we help develop that sleep habit. When we have other activities going on in bed, we lose that association. For adults, a big problem is electronics in bed. Not only does the blue light disrupt our circadian rhythms, but that stimuli encourages us to be active, wakes us up, and teaches us that the bed is not for sleeping, but wakeful activities. So, for children, just be mindful when adding things like mobiles or toys to their bed. If it supports their sleep, then it's fine. But if you find they're not sleeping, try some trial and error and reduce that. Uh, if you find noise is needed, perhaps just a little white noise or just a simple music box. Another thing is inconsistent sleep locations. Now, when children are still in that infancy stage, because they're sleeping upwards to 18 hours a day, they really can sleep anywhere. But as they start to grow, they really need their bed to be the sleeping environment. Having them nap in different locations, such as in the car or at a friend's house or in the living room is not gonna promote good sleep as we're not building that sleep habit, that bed association. I know it's really difficult, but if you're having trouble with sleep, you really need to build your day schedule around their sleep. Make it so you're at home during nap time and do the same pattern or routine before sleep, which I'll dive into a little bit later. And again, apply this to yourself a big thing again with the electronics is if we're watching them, we become more awake and no longer are tired. If you find you've gotten to the point where you're no longer tired and you're still in bed, get out of your bed, do some activities, help yourself relax, and then get back into bed when you're tired again. So you keep that bed sleep association. So the next common mistakes are having no pre-sleep routine and an inconsistent sleep schedule. 
And I kind of paired these two together because they both have to do with that developing that habit for sleep. Habit, if you haven't watched the other work, caregiver workshop on activity planning, habit supports our bodies in making things less cognitive de demanding. As well, it provides your child with some, some control and security as what's happening is predictable. When you develop a pre-sleep routine, you support your child in that winding down relaxation stage so that they can get ready for sleep. When making a routine, try to make a short sleep routine. And it doesn't have to be rigid. Uh, say if your routine is a book, a song, and maybe a bath, it doesn't have to be the same song and same book unless that's something you want. Be flexible, but keep the routine in general the same. And this includes doing the routine between before any sleep or nap. All sleeps in that same bed. Again, we're building that association. It's also important that you don't stretch these routines by granting additional quests, like a second story or a second songs. A really helpful tip is if you develop an endpoint, such as a good night kiss on the forehead means good night. End of routine, time for sleep. The inconsistent sleep schedule and nap times are also really important. When infants are still developing, regular sleep times support them in developing that internal body clock. With regular sleep and wake times, your body learns when it should be awake and when it should be sleepy. On that note, uh, sometimes people hope Oh, if I keep my child up a little bit later, the next morning they'll sleep in. Although our body clocks are still developing at that age, they're very, very powerful. They want you to wake up that same time each day. So if you stay up late the night before, your child's likely going to wake up the same time as they usually do and just have a very tired day with a lot of fluctuation. So try your best to stick to those sleep-wake times. The next is staying with your child until they've fallen asleep. Now, if you're co-sleeping, this doesn't really apply, but if you're a parent who wants to have their own sleeps in their own bedroom, away from their child, then this is a common issue. Remember when I mentioned in the REM cycle, we have those micro awakenings. As adults, we don't tend to remember them, but children do. They wake up and begin to process what's happening. If you're no longer there, they look for you to help them fall back asleep. As this is part of their sleep routine. They're used to you being there. This again goes back to that having a clear endpoint during the bedtime routine. Let your child know you're around, kiss them goodbye, and then let them know you've gone. So this is one strategy that can support your child in recognizing that they can fall asleep without you. Now I just wanted to mention some brief strategies based on the different tips I've kind of already gone through. The first is things you can do during the daytime. Be active. Use that energy up. You have those periods of wakefulness and sleepiness and respond to them with what your body needs. In those wakefulness times, be active. And when your body needs that downtime, relax. It's great. It's what your body wants. Also, eating those nutritious meals and at the same time each day. That routine is going to help build those periods of wakefulness and sleepiness again. So you're not going from moments of high energy to crashing. You kind of stay more stable. Another thing is to avoid caffeinated food and beverages. Again, they'll disrupt, they'll keep them awake longer, and then your whole pattern to kind of change it around. Next would be get lots of sunlight during the day. It helps with the circadian rhythms and then dim those lights at night. Again, to help with their circadian rhythm. Finally, try, try your best to have that consistent sleep and wake time. Even if you went to bed a little bit later, your body wants you up at that same time. So try to follow suit. 
The next is a little tip for the bedtime routine and a common fun one to use is the five B's. So it could be a bedtime bite, a healthy snack, maybe half an hour before, a bath, brush your teeth, perhaps one last break up to the bathroom, and then a book. You can choose however you'd like to do your routine. This is just one option. And again, remember to have that end point, such as a kiss goodnight, or a final story, uh, maybe a specific song, and don't stretch beyond that end point. Next is some tips for the bedroom. Again, limit that noise. If they do need some noise, maybe a light music player or some white noise. Dim lighting. If there's any fears, you can always have a night light. Make it calming and relaxing, not overstimulating, not full of toys. Help them know that the bedroom is for sleeping only. And promote self-soothing. So if a child wakes up, they need to learn ways to get back to sleep. A bedtime buddy could be a teddy bear or a blanket, some sort of comfort animal or stuffy that they know is always gonna be there. A bedtime basket kinda helps along with those periods of time where they can't get back to sleep. You can fill it with light, relaxing activities, such as maybe a book or a simple puzzle when they get older. These activities aren't overstimulating. It can be built into the pre-sleep routine, unwinding, or it can support them in just getting back to sleep. And finally, just because nightmares do come up, my number one tip would be talk about it. Reassure them that it's okay and a bad dream. And just be a good listener and provide that comfort. Let them know that you're there, that nothing wrong happened, and that they're okay. Again, with the bedtime buddy, perhaps a nightlight or comfort object can support them. Some things that may stimulate a nightmare could be a scary book or overstimulating television before bed. So if you find nightmares happening, just try to limit those and choose material that's more calming. And finally, just a summary of these tips. Plenty of sun during the day. Plan naps and quiet times and stick to that schedule. Avoid the late afternoon as that may impact nighttime sleep. Avoid caffeinated food and beverages. Dim lights, limit noise, and other stimuli. Try to follow a bedtime routine. It doesn't have to be rigid, but try to make it the same. Promote relaxation with it. Have an endpoint. And make sure your sleep and wake times, as well as your locations, are consistent. I know I just gave a ton of information, so a very good uh, book recommendation from my professor is called Healthy Sleep Habits, Healthy Child by Mark Weisbla. And this goes over the science of sleep and can give you some really good tips for helping your child sleep. It's a bit expensive, but when libraries open back up, it is available at the library. So if this is something you wanna work on, Here's a great book that you can check out. I also included some calming good night books that I like, including Good Night Moon, Pajama Time, Good Night, Good Night Sleepyhead, and Good Night, Good Night Construction Site. Again, choose whatever book works for you and your child. These are just some suggestions. I know that was a lot of information, so I hope what you can take from it today is the power of routine and consistency as well as it takes a little bit of trial and error and that these habits can be applied to your child but also you. Healthy sleep habits help us all and can make each day so so much better when we're not fluctuating from sleepy to tired when we're more even keel. So I wanted to thank you all so much for listening to this workshop 
and I hope you guys all have a beautiful sleep tonight. Thank you so much. Before I forget, I also have the references and I will highlight the one that is the PMR script if that's something you want to do. Thanks and have a great day.